Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Hey, everybody. Good morning. You know it's early on a Saturday morning, kind of like a Saturday morning cartoon. It's Andy, a.k.a. Love Retro BTW on Twitter. Welcome to another wonderful morning, an episode of Cafe BTW, a morning gaming podcast. And as you can see, we have a guest over here, a good old friend from the Twitterverse, uh, is G. G to the next level. What's up, man? Good morning and welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, always drinking my coffee. Uh, people always complain to me, Andy, why do you do this show so early in the morning? Well, it wouldn't be a morning show if we didn't do this early. So um, I'm doing that. great, man. You know, it's it's a long time coming for us. I uh, just want to give some context that we've known each other in the Twitter world for like four to five years, the retro Twitter world. Um, so it's really cool to like, not only like officially meet you, but uh, have you on the podcast. So I uh, really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me on. I, I, I'm glad that it, we finally got a chance to meet and talk. So, yeah, yeah. And I do want to say thank you all uh, who are watching on VOD as well. Really appreciate your viewership. Um, and today it's going to be really cool. We're going to talk a little bit about a more focused kind of uh, retrospective look at Capcom which, uh, you know, our good friend here, G, has a connection to Capcom, which we'll get into. But, G, I wanted to, you know, I always like, like to go back in time in the beginning. And back in time in the beginning means learning a little bit about your connection to games. Because the wonderful world of gaming, there's always a story to tell on how you became a gamer, right? What is right. it that kind of sparks a memory from your past that really probably hit the ground running for you to be a gamer and, and love this industry that we're in? Well, I'd probably say just stems all the way back from the very beginning. Like I can purely remember the moments that when I used to go to the arcade with my dad. So my first real experience with playing video games was in the arcades with my dad. My mom and my dad used to do bowling on Wednesday nights and the bowling alley that we would go to had this massive arcade and it was mostly Sega stuff. That was the thing. They must have had some sort of contract with Sega, or maybe the owner really liked Sega or something like that. But um, they had pretty much all the major stuff. Like they had Outrun, they had Altered Beast, they had all like the classic, classic games that you pretty much know Sega from back in like the early, early, like late 80s, early 90s. And right? they were kings of the arcade. They did a lot of arcade work and did some amazing oh, yeah. stuff. Amazing stuff. Oh, yeah. But I distinctly remember the very first uh, game that I played with my dad. And it was an arcade shooter by the name of Vanguard. It was, uh, mm. I believe, Namco, right? Uh, they, or is it SNK? Uh, no, SNK was Vanguard 2. Namco was the first one. Uh, but yeah, Vanguard, it was, um, it was, if you've never seen it before, it's cool. Like, it was a shooter that had multiple different perspectives. Like, sometimes it was side scrolling and going across sticks. Sometimes it was vertical. Sometimes it was, like, diagonal. And just the music was just so iconic. It's just something about that game just really spoke to me. And I sat there and I played it for literally, like, the entire time that they were bowling. So my dad would normally be like, okay, you know, here's five, 10 bucks, go play whatever you want. And that game just stuck with me so much. And many of the other games we did, like he was a big fan of Pac-Man. So I became a big fan of Pac-Man. And then later on, we bought an Atari. Our first console was an Atari 5200. Ooh. So we got an Atari 50, which I have to this day. It's like, it's an the Atari original one. You have the original yes. one we're talking about. That's awesome. Well, the, I mean, it wasn't a 2600 because we got in late, but we did get the 2600 adapter though. So we did get that. But yeah, we got the 5200 with Pac-Man and Vanguard and Mario Bros and all the good stuff. And then it just kind of went from there. We got an NES and then I kept playing games like going on to the NES. But then everything really, really started building Christmas 1991. And it's all because of um, of a certain blue hedgehog that happened to uh, <laughs> to catch my eye. And I wonder who really that's who that might be. Mm, um, I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> yeah, and you're a big Sega guy. You're you're and and by the way, I'm also a Sega guy. I don't know if you know, my big claim to fame in my personal collection is my Sega Saturn collection. I was a kid that had a Saturn, and I still have a lot of my original Saturn games, and I kind of collected. So I'm a Sega guy. I would like to say as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're more of a Genesis guy. Not that I don't love the genesis it's just i have more saturn games than i do most of my sega collection so um, see, i see i see you're a man of culture <laughs> yes i'm a saturn. man of culture oh, you know what i was playing saturn. last night i was playing last bronx the fighting game on Ooh, saturn fun so fun, game. fun game underrated nobody talks about last bronx no one talks talk about, about like it. all all the all the, the the sega fighting games like the 3d fighting games no one talks about last bronx no it's one talks so about good. it yeah so, so i so good. i played it last night and i beat it on the arcade mode fun game 
Um, nice. But yeah, let's talk. So that's really cool. I love the connection to the, your dad. You know, it's funny though. So your dad was into games, right? I'm assuming. Like he actually liked video games, it sounds like. Oh, uh, yes or, and no. Okay. I, I, it wasn't really that much of a gamer. He just really played games as just a way to spend time with me. So like if I got oh, excited okay. about a game, he would get excited about a game. But uh, there were very few games that he would actually really go out of his way to go kind of play if I wasn't really involved. With the exception of one, Arnold Palmer's Tournament Golf on Ooh. the Genesis. <laughs> That's awesome. Because the funny thing is that Christmas 91, uh, we got the Genesis, we got Sonic, we got Altered Beast, we got Outrun, and then Arnold Palmer's Tournament Golf. So he bought that for himself. <laughs> That's awesome. Because, you know, my childhood, like, my parents were oblivious to video games, though they were very supportive in a sense that they would still buy me games and stuff, but they didn't know anything. Uh, Commodore says my dad loved Road Rash. Road Rash. Great oh, game. Road Rash is excellent. Excellent game. Road so, oh, Mikey Love Retro. I see. Yeah, you're right. It was SNK for both of them. I thought it was only for the second one. But okay, SNK did both uh, Vanguard. Vanguard's a wonderful. That's yeah. still a great game today. And shout out, Mikey. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, let's let's fast forward to now. Tell me a little bit about what you do. You're a great content creator in the retro gaming space. I want to learn a little bit about what you do on like an everyday kind of retro life. Um, and a little bit about catch us up on what, uh, what we could expect from checking out all your socials and stuff. Sure. So I've been doing YouTube for roughly about five years on my own. I first started off co-hosting on another YouTube uh, uh, channel by the name of I Retro Gamer. Um, he now does his own thing under my retro life, but now we've actually uh, both kind of done our own sort of separate channels. Uh, but uh, with YouTube, basically, it's all about retro stuff and uh, mostly Sega, but a lot of things all around the, the, the scope. And I try to put out videos at least like twice a month at least i know things have been a little bit different just because I've, I've switched over to doing currently i'm doing content creating full time so i've had to switch focus on a few different things but um i'm coming in full circle back to youtube very very soon uh i also stream on twitch roughly yeah. about four to five days a week there's a 5200 so i, I, oh, yeah, stream I on Twitch, that, yeah. uh, roughly about um four to five days a week depending on what it is um and it's also retro and retro inspired stuff like i'm either doing stuff on the sega genesis like do sega every tuesday nights and uh, right now, currently, I'm doing like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild on Thursdays. Mm. So again, new games starring retro characters, right? So like great stuff. I, I'm in love with that game. It's been really, really great. And uh, but yeah, and I'm also off on the side. It's still a long way away from finalizing. But I'm uh, I'm also writing a book about the Sega Genesis as well. You are so, really yep, like, I am. are you talking like digital or are we talking both digital and uh, both. physical? Wow, really? Both. We're going both digital and physical. I've already got a publisher lined up, which is awesome. Wow. So, dude, that's but the cool. thing is, is just that, yeah, it's going to be it's, it's called Growing Up Genesis. And it essentially is Great going name. to be about just starting off with just childhood memories, things of how we really got started, what really is Sega of the retro of today and and of the past. And it's also going to be an A to Z compendium on the U.S. library of the Sega Genesis. So it's not going to be full, Dude, full, full great. reviews like you see in other magazines and other books and whatnot. It's going to be like coffee table bite-sized reviews. That's really so, cool. And very, when very cool what is the, what's the timeline? Do you have like a, a timeline uh, for it? I don't currently have a timeline at the moment, but I'm hoping to at least have it draft ready by the end of this year. That's that's kind of the that's kind of the goal and to at least have the, the, the draft portions ready. It's so that way we can work on graphics and visuals and everything like that. And then other additions. I'm also um, back. We might talk. I'm also looking for anybody who actually has like any specific like Sega memories that we would like to have like a snippet in the book. That sort of thing. If too. you're looking for a Sega so, Saturn snippet for the book, you let me know because I'm like uh, the Saturn Sega... may come later. This oh, okay. One, this one's all oh, about Genesis. Oh, it's all Genesis. My bad. Right. This Otherwise, all Genesis. I should write a book called, you know, me and my Saturn or something. Dude, do it. Do it. <laughs> I keep forgetting. You're just saying it's specifically Genesis. But if you... For now. If you need that Saturn snippet down the line, you let me know. I, Thank you. I'll help you out. <laughs> no, so what is your... So tell me a little bit about your collection when it comes to... What is your biggest pieces of your collection uh, currently? Hmm. Well, so I've got a U.S. retail Genesis set. Complete. Not all of it complete in box, but all of them are at least the cart. And um, how many is basically. that? Do you know? Do you know offhand? I don't know offhand. I have to go back and double check the numbers because the thing is, when I initially had a number, I originally said it was 683. Wow. But then, uh, thanks to my buddy Sega Steve, uh, he actually enlightened me on a couple of things. And that some of the accolade games that are originally not licensed actually turn out to be licensed later on. So that's why the number kind of fluctuates because. The thing is that what a lot of people don't know, Accolade, uh, the Bubsy team and whatnot, many of their original games on the Sega Genesis were unlicensed, but mm. then they would get re-released -re later on 
from the ballistics line with a Sega official stamp seal of approval on the cellophane, not on the box. Wow. Nothing else changed. So if you open it up, it'll still say unlicensed. So many people don't know, like, okay, can we confirm unless anybody still has some sealed? Are they licensed? Are they not? So this is where things start getting a little bit murky. So when people ask, oh, what's the number? I'm like, it's somewhere between 680 to 705. It's somewhere between that because we have That's to a look good amount of games, man. Which ones are official and which ones are not, you know? And some people might actually count the ones that showed up on Sega Channel. I personally don't. But yeah, it's like That's somewhere cool, around man. that realm, but... I, you know, believe it or not, as being as big of a Sega guy as I am, I don't have the biggest Genesis collection. I do have some great, you know, I have like a lot of the heavy hitters and a good amount, but personally, I have a lot of NES and mm, Saturn. I love the NES. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we're we'll going to talk, talk about, about how much I love about the NES. <laughs> I, I, I'm excited. Um, but cool, man. So, you know, it's, and, and I don't know, Genzo, did we have, oh yeah, there it is. If you see in chat, we have the Nightbot running, but I don't know if we have a command Genzo for G, but you could see there's his link tree in chat. Feel free to check out all of his socials and we'll share that again uh, when we post the episode on YouTube as well. So everyone has access to stuff, but there's the link tree as well. If you're interested, Biff says Genesis was the second system I purchased with my own money. Nice. Very that, nice. That is very big monumental moment for a gamer. When you were a kid, when you actually bought something with your own money. I remember that. I remember when I worked at the supermarket and I, I could actually afford to buy something for myself for once. Uh, Mikey says, follow all this, his stuff. Great content. And Aww, thank you, Mikey. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> So yeah, let's um so we are going to talk about Capcom and I got to be honest with you. I love Capcom. There's a lot I didn't know and we're going to talk a little bit about the beginnings of Capcom and I wanted to learn a bit about you, but we always start with like a little bit of a current event topic. And obviously you're a huge Sonic fan. I know that. And I uh, just want to talk I know we talked offline on it, but what did you think of the Sonic 2 movie? Uh, oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I mean, the thing is that it pretty much did everything that I could expect of a sequel of something like the Sonic movie to, to do. Like, seriously, like they basically they took all the world that they built up from the original one, expanded on it. Just the way that they represented Knuckles. It just Elba did a tremendous job as Knuckles. I mean, like, bang, home run. He did a tremendous job. Just the animation, the fight scenes, just the way that everything kind of played out. And then that that tease that tease that they did at the oh my goodness i'm just like man i just i now i was already excited for two when um when we saw that from the first one but now now three it's like this is gonna take it on a whole nother level yeah, yeah go see it if you have not seen it go, i won't say anything more about that because <laughs> I, there's some people in there haven't se haven't seen it i don't want to spoil it yeah but i will say it go see it stay during the credits and it's just, it's it's awesome. It's really it's, cool. It's and really just awesome. so you know, Sonic 2 became the highest grossing video game movie in U.S. history. Yeah, I saw that. that really, like, really yeah. great. Really cool. Um, which brings us to the topic at hand. Nintendo came out about a couple of weeks after the movie Sonic 2 came out and said, we decided we're going to be pushing and delaying uh, our movie into the next spring. So they're going to be doing, I think, spring of 2023. We haven't seen anything from this movie. First of all, what is your thoughts on that whole backlash with Chris Pratt and and stuff like that with the, with this movie? Oh uh, well, I mean, Chris Pratt is a first tool enough actor, and I think most of the people. I'm not familiar with who's playing Princess Peach, but uh, most of the most of the, the girl from Queen's are, uh, the the girl from Queen's oh Queen's Gambit Gambit is playing, which okay. she looks like Princess Peach. I mean, I guess yeah, but it's a CG movie. Oh right, so, oh yeah, I'm she's like, doing the voice, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I've always been kind of trepidatious on it itself. Because I'm just wondering, Mario in itself, I haven't played enough of the story-driven Mario games to really see how expansive Mario's world really is. And I'm just wondering how well they're going to portray that into a film. And then you look at the cast, I'm just like, oh, well, my thing is, is that I don't really have that much of, of a huge issue with Chris Pratt playing Mario. I just think it's kind of strange. Because yeah, it was I'm a weird like, casting. Yeah, it's kind of, a, it's more or less a, see, the thing is that they didn't really get a big, big name to be Sonic. They got a big name to be Knuckles. But they didn't get a big name to be Sonic. They've actually casted somebody who could really portray the character the way that they wanted to do it. And he nailed it. Yeah, you know? Ben Ben to Schwartz, me, right? Is it Ben he Schwartz? He did. Yeah. Ben Schwartz. Yeah, and he he's a, he's a, he's a cool guy and uh and he did mm -hmm. a great job. You can tell good. with that movie, everybody, literally everybody, especially Jim Carrey, 
everybody who was involved with this film had a blast doing it. You, you can absolutely tell. I know. But with this one, it's just, it's kind of strange, but at the same token, we don't know enough about it yet. Like, we don't know what the main storyline is. All we know is that, hey, it's going to have Mario, it's going to have Peach, it's going to have Luigi, it's going to have Bowser, and it's going to have a couple of other characters, it's going to have Toad, it's going to have a couple of other characters, but that's literally it. We don't know a whole, whole lot about it until next spring, so they got a whole nother year, which is enough time. Yeah. Like, it's enough time for, for us to really do that, but I kind of... I mean, it might be a hack theory, but like I, I'm kind of on that same sort of mentality that I'm thinking that, yeah, I wonder if they were going gung ho ahead with this. And then they saw what the Sonic movie did. And it's just like, wow, they stepped their game up. I'm like, uh, maybe we might want to refocus on this one a little bit. It's not quite it's not quite ready to go into the oven. We're still in the preparation stages yet. We're still gathering materials. We're still doing the mixing bowl. It's not ready to go in the oven just yet. So, yeah, I agree. That's fine. I think they did. I mean, I, I can't confirm, but I mean, look, Nintendo is notorious for delaying things because they feel like, look, we'd rather have something that works than something that doesn't. So they're, yep. they're very much, and I have no problem when Nintendo delays game because I trust them as yep. as I've always trusted them. Like now, I'm a, I'm a huge Splatoon player, right? That's one of the main games that I play on Twitch with everybody. And I know a lot of the, there was a lot of, uh, I'm not going to say cries because most people were okay with it, but there were some people like, oh, it's not going to be in the summer. It's actually happening in September. It's going to be in the fall. And I was just like, if Nintendo is going to push this over just a little bit more, you know, it's for a good reason. Absolutely. When Nintendo delays something, you know, it's still going to be good. I'm perfectly fine with Breath of the Wild being delayed until next year. I'm sure. just now getting started to the original. Yeah. <laughs> so sure. I'm just like, yeah, I'm okay with it. Normally I'm okay with game delays as long as it still winds up being good. I mean, there are some companies that are kind of notorious for, for not delaying games and then them not being all that great. I yeah. had a recent but, horrible but yeah. experience. <laughs> Cyberpunk was a very good example Cyberpunk. of just what a mess. And you know what? I I did the same thing with No Man's Sky, but No Man's Sky's experience with No Man's Sky's first release had nowhere near the horrible experience I had with Cyberpunk when no. it came out. It, I, it was the worst game experience. It crashed... Literally, at least once every playthrough, it was like hard. It was just terrible. Um, so, G PhD. <laughs> when you're making Love a game, it. video Love game it. world, the Almighty Pope was saying, "Wizard just wants to be afraid." Screw him. Oh, if them, we don't know. Screw them. Hold on <laughs> one second. I got nope. your voice on your Twitch uh, video playing. There we go. I got it off. Uh oh, um, oh no. <laughs> I was like, is he talking? When I'm, I'm my bad. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, let's jump into. Capcom. And, you know, obviously Capcom is synonymous with just one of the OG publishers, developers, uh, video games in the history course of our existence in this wonderful world. But let's talk about you. You do stuff with Capcom currently. You're kind of like an ambassador, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Correct. Okay, so I'm part of the Capcom Creator Program, and basically what that is is that Capcom uh, reached out recently to look for content creators that have a love for, you know, their style, their culture, and their products. So people that are involved with many of the things that Capcom makes, whether it be retro or today, you know, YouTubers, Twitch streamers, book writers, blog writers, cosplayers, like they're looking for, for all kinds of artists. They were looking for all kinds of different people that love their products. And so I was like, you know what, if there's one thing about Capcom, like I love a lot of Capcom's uh, IPs, or whatever, but my personal favorite out of all of them is Mega Man. Like, and I, uh, Mega Man is one that's been stuck with me since the very original Mega Man game on PS1. And then when I saw that this was a thing, I was like, I had to, t I had to reach out because I was just like, yeah, uh, I stream a lot of Mega Man a lot, and I also do other kind of like, I love Strider. That's another one of my favorite Capcom uh, IPs that are out there, Resident Evil. A lot of my favorite ones out there, and I just talk about my history with them. And then sure enough, they got back with me. It's like, okay, yeah, you're approved. Welcome That's in. That's awesome. And yeah, so what they do is that they basically give materials and tools for other creators to work on with different Capcom products. They help push you along. Uh, they basically help push you along if um, if you're actually looking to make new content and whatnot with it. They've got a Discord that has a lot of fun people to talk to if you want to do collabs and whatnot. And um, it's not really, it's, that's why I kind of say it's like, it's not really um, that I, 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 I like to think of it as more of like being part of the program unless it's like a sponsor or something like that because they don't actually monetarily pay but they do help get you out there. Like they're really helped. It's like, hey, we really want to push you. Like we love your content. We want to help push you and help get you out there. So, and in awesome. the meanwhile, hey, here's some cool Capcom stuff. So you cannot yep. complain about that. And I do want to say thanks, Six, for the follow. And hello, David. Welcome to the chat. That's really cool, man. Yeah, that's a fixation. <laughs> um, I I love um 
I love uh, just like when companies like that are working with streamers and content creators to like really do some cool stuff. So really awesome. Um, and yeah, welcome to chat. First time chat. I really love seeing some people from, I guess this is someone from your community. Is that right? Yes. I would imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so let's, you know, I, I always do a little research. I must say before we get into this, I am no way, shape or form a Capcom historian. And I was, you know, <laughs> definitely not. But I think it's important to talk about a little bit of um, did a little research on the beginnings of Capcom. I'm not sure, um, G, how much you know um, about like kind of the early beginnings of Capcom. Any any sense of history? For you? Uh, really, really before the uh, before the eight bit days of Capcom, like I know that I was exposed to a few of their games in the arcade, but other than that, like as far as the historian piece wise, I'd I'd like to know more. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. So this gentleman's photo you see here is the grandfather father of Capcom, and this is and I'm going to totally butcher his name. Uh, this is Kenzo Tatsu Tach. Tachimoto, and, and <laughs> excuse me if I totally butchered that, but it's important to know who the father, the face of something is. Um, so I don't know much about him, but basically there was a company before Capcom that was called, and let me pull it up. I have my, uh, my, my stuff here uh, ready to roll. Um, and it was called, I'll tell you what the company was called. It's called IRM Corporation. IRM Corporation um, was basically uh, doing a couple of things in the electronic game machines market in 1979. So that's where, that's the year, G, that kind of the sort of early beginnings of Capcom started, 1979. Okay, so yep. very early, very kind of right at the, the back end of the, the late 70s when video game stuff started happening. You know, the 2600 for reference was 77, Atari. So you kind of get an idea of what time frame they're in. In 1981, they actually changed their name to Japanese Capsule Computer Company. But right. then it wasn't until 1983 that they established the name Capcom. And now I want to give some... Do you know what Capcom means, G? Do you know what it means? Uh, go for it. So Capcom... For, and I'm just reading this verbatim. Uh, <laughs> the name Capcom <laughs> is an abbreviation of Capsule Computer. Capsule Computing, right? Oh, okay. Caps I thought it was like Capsule Computing. Capsule Computers. Got it. Capsule okay. Computers. Yeah. And the first three letters of Capsule is C-A-P. And the first three letters of a computer is C-O-M. Capcom. It's as simple as putting those two together. This was a phrase symbolic of the internal company objective to create a new game experience that would exceed that of a rival personal computers, which had also been increasing in popularity during the same period. The capsule segment of Capcom name was based on two key components, a container packed to the brim with fun and a desire to create securely packaged games to decrease the rapid expansion of pirated materials. Really involved <laughs> history around one name. I oh, love yeah. it, right? And hey, Tao of Power, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, Six says, yeah, I know, G, funny enough, I got an invite forever ago to the Twitter community from you as well, love Retro BTW. I just didn't notice it until a few, oh, join on in. And yeah, we started nice. this retro community on Twitter and we have over a thousand members now. It's really just a place, you, there's no pressure to post, just a place to be in like a, a a, a timeline that doesn't go to your main feed, and if you want to share your pickups, you could feel comfortable sharing them, and it doesn't go to like the broader scope of everywhere. But yeah, man, what do you think of that? It's really cool history of the name, I think, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's just like I always love hearing about like the history of the startups of all the different types of companies that we've grown to love now, like you know, service games, Sega, that sort of thing. Like I love hearing about that kind of stuff, and and people think like Capcom really just kind of started in like the NES days, and I was like, no, 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 there's there's still some good history behind that. Yeah, so absolutely. especially within yeah, as you're going into about uh, capsule computing, it's very cool. Yeah, it's a really uh, I love like these the the creation and the you know why names are names and where they come from. What's up, Sanity? Good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you in chat. <laughs> um, but as you can see, in 1983. They really, as a company called Capcom, they got it started in coin-op, upright coin-op machines with the release in 1983 of a game called Little League. But here's the thing, G, I can't find anything else but this like small little picture of it. Now, <laughs> what I did find, though, is that just to give people an idea of what type of machine it was, this is what the, these were Japanese upright coin operated mechanical machines okay and this is a video of a guy showing you a, a kind of oh. look at these type of machines so capcom actually made two of these they made one called little league 
But this is just to give everyone an idea of it's kind of like in a lot of ways, a weird upright mechanical machine like game instead of a pinball machine. It's kind of like a weird upright coin up machine. Have you ever seen any of these before? It's kind of um, interesting. I haven't seen anything like that. When I'm looking at that, it makes me think of um, I think it was called Ice Cold Beer. Like oh, an what a great that, that game! Where you actually could could control it to where you could control the um, the ball that actually comes down. Something sort of like that. I know it's not the same thing, but when I see this, that's what it immediately makes me think about. It makes me think about that game, and that was a great game. That's an amazing game. That's a per that's a wonderful game. Um, there's a couple arcades here in LA that still have ice cold beer and. Uh, really good game. Um, fun. Nice. Especially if you have a few beers in you. It's a really fun <laughs> game to play. Uh, but as you can see, this is very early stuff. Um, and let me pull this up. Uh, so the other coin-op upright game they released was called Fever Chase. And then it wasn't until 1984, and it's a big jump from those upright machines, the arcade release of the wonderful... 1942. Any connection to 1942? I did play that in the arcade. Uh, 1942 and 1943, both of them I, I think were just wonderful little games too. And yeah, I haven't I haven't gotten a chance to see like an arcade of those in so long, but I do remember playing that one with my dad back in the day too. Yeah, and uh, hey Gamma Droid, what's up? Happy Saturday, welcome. Um, yeah, this is uh, you know I obviously the the NES version. I didn't really play the arcade version as much, but the NES version for sure. And then another game that came out in the arcade that they released was Commando. Commando. Um, and, yeah. and this is a fun one. Mm -hmm. I love the NES Commando. Like, I, I, I never really played Commando in the arcade. But I know uh, on the NES, I played this game a lot, and I played Gunsmoke a lot, too. Like, Gunsmoke is a good one, too. Games. So just to give you an idea of what year we're in, we're in 1984 now. Um, and But then we move up to 1985. So 1985 is the release of Commando. Um, and then moving up the kind of uh, timeline, a wonderful game, Ghost and Goblins Arcade is released uh, in 1986. So uh, we're already in the mid 80s now. So they've already started to do a lot of arcade stuff. And um, they did start to release in 1985. They also put the release of 1942 in the NES and Commando um, as well. But what's your what's your relationship with this one? Ghosts and Goblins. Oh, Ghosts and Goblins. All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those games that I have, like, an extreme love-hate relationship with. Like, there are just some days that, like, I feel like I'm in a groove and I'll start playing either Ghosts and Goblins or Ghouls and Goblins... Oh, Ghouls and Ghosts, excuse me. Like, or Ghouls and Ghosts, and I'm just like, they're so, they're so well-made. They're such great games. Goodness, do I get frustrated playing them, though. <laughs> especially, especially the NES Ghosts and Goblins. That one, I'm like, no, I can't play that one at all. But... But Genesis, Ghouls and Ghosts, wonderful. Talking about a wonderful port of the game. Super Ghouls and Ghosts on NES, great too. Like it, they're, they're great games, but just be prepared for a challenge. That's that's really that's one of the best things I can say about it. It's gonna kick your butt, but it, they're such great games. That's awesome. I got a big question from Six. So as someone that doesn't know much about Ghosts and Goblins, I have a question. I played it on the mm. Sega Saturn and was curious which version that was port interesting. I've never actually played that one, Six. I played the Master System one. The Master, yeah, Mikey Loves Retro just said it right there in the chat. The Master System version is a very good port. It's very, it moves a little bit slower, but it's actually a very good port. Graphically, it's excellent. Another, another great port was the one on the, uh, the Super Graphics, the PC Engine Super Graphics. That's also an excellent port, but unfortunately, limited continues. Yeah, you're not gonna get very far. You know what? But no, it, 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 I'm assuming it's probably gonna be loosely based off the arcade. I would think, but I'm you not played sure Ghosts played and Saturn Goblins version. on the Saturn. I don't remember it on the Saturn. Are we talking? I, I, I maybe was it on the Saturn? Hey, Younglings, what's up? It was. It, it did get ported to the Saturn, did but it? I don't fully remember. Maybe it did. It did. Oh wait, that is totally true. Here it is. I've never played it though. That is so interesting. As a Sega Saturn guy, I didn't really realize that. Oh, that's cool. Well, it's one of the many things Come that we here. didn't get in America. That's true. So oh, okay. Saturn. That that is very Keep true. Um and Logan. wow, thank you so much, young oh, nice. for gifting five subs to Mystery of Repair, Retro Game Brews, Acid, Mikey Loves Retro, and and Bowser. Wow, younglings, nice. coming in with the subs. Keep your eye thank you so much. That's Logan. so so sweet of you. Thank you so much. Uh, also, shout out to Youngly. She's our one of our mods in the Twitter community as well. Uh, oh, sweet. And then Sanity says, now Andy so has a gaping here. hole in his Saturn collection. Yeah. You know what? I definitely do, but I think, I don't know if it was U.S. released. 
I don't think it, it was wasn't. US. It wasn't. No, it was, it was, uh, Six is absolutely right. It was part of the uh, the Capcom Generations collections. None of those came to the US. So not for the Saturn. Uh, yeah. So, Oof. so let's right. go to 1987. I'll keep your eye open. G, and that's the release oh, of the first ever Street Fighter arcade. Mm. Um, <laughs> what's your connection to the actual arcade version of Street Fighter? So I've never played an actual so arcade here. Street Fighter cabinet. I know that it had like special pressure sensitive buttons. It however, did. I've never actually well, seen yeah. one. And but I have played the PC Engine version, and then I played it later on on um, I think it was on one of the Capcom generations ones for PS2. It was on one of those two, and I played right. it. It's an important game in history. Keep your eye open. Logan. That's about the best I could say about it. It's, it's a hard one to go back here, to. Play here are those buttons yeah. you're talking about. So this was in a version that had the punch buttons. And I played, gee, I actually played the punch button version in the arcade as a kid. Um, Ooh, did you? Yeah, nice. I, I definitely did. I remember vividly, you know, I'm a, I might skew a little older than you. I still remember a little <laughs> bit of my uh, history. And and thanks, uh, Malk, for the follow. I see that Genzo gifted Hey, what's up, Malky Rob? Uh, Genzo gifted, and I think Malky Rob's a, a Twitter friend too. Good old mm -hmm. uh, Twitter community guy. Uh, Street Fighter is king of the fighting games, but the problem with the punch thing was it was really just you would hurt your hand, and also those machines were beat beat up a lot. So they actually converted. They actually you know went back to like just the normal stick. But I think they released them both at the same time. They had the punch ones and they had the regular ones as well. Um, but dude, this is a big part of my arcade history i grew up in the you know i went to the arcades in the late 80s and the early 90s and this was very much a part of my history and as the game wasn't nearly as good as it got with street fighter 2 it was super cool um mm -hmm. and and if you ever had a chance to play the punch version it was really cool but obviously street fighter is synonymous with capcom i mean this game becomes so important to the history of Capcom. So obviously it all kicked off in 1987, but let's talk about one that means a lot to you. What does it mean to you? What is your memory of Mega Man? Well, let's talk about Mega Man. We got to talk about Mega Man. <laughs> all right. So yeah, we got, heck yeah, we got to talk about Mega Man. So it's like Mega Man is so important to me because I remember like, so when we grew up, uh, there was a, I don't know if you're familiar, depending on where you are in the United States, like there was a chain, I think many of them are still around too. There was a chain of grocery stores called Albertsons that were around and we had one within walking distance. And so we got a chance to play and rent a lot of games for literally a dollar a piece. And so we were, my dad and I would, or my mom, either one of us would actually go into their, their go shopping and we would go into the rental shop and I would just look at the NES boxes and see if there's any one of them that really speaks out to me now. Somebody who grew up playing games like Super Mario and whatnot. So truth be told, my not my first favorite genre of game, but I guess my favorite retro genre of video games is a side-scrolling platformer. Like mascot platformers are absolutely 100% my jam. Mm -hmm. And probably the first one, because I can't even say this about Super Mario, probably the first one to really, really, really click with me was Mega Man 1. And it probably really was like just just playing through each one. I was intrigued by all the different robot designs and also somebody who loves like robots, like Transformers, GoBots, that sort of thing. So just trying to figure out like what's the best way to go through the path. It was one of the first games that actually had a nonlinear kind of path. So like you choose which way to go. And all of this just everything just clicked with me like back in the day. And I can even say like even as a kid, I beat the original Mega Man on the NES. And whenever every single one of them, like a new one would come out, Mega Man 2, 3, 4, 5, and even 6. When all those came out when I was a kid, like, I had to get them, like, almost immediately. And I loved them. Like, and even to this day, like, I'm so glad that Capcom finally uh, went back and decided, hey, we're going to go back to Mega Man. Like, whether it would be, like, through Mega Man 9, which be wound up becoming one of my favorite games in the entire franchise. Like, all the way up to Mega Man 11 now. It's so great that they not only have kept Mega Man as a part of their legacy, but they're still working on new games and new stuff in the franchise. But he's been there with me since the very beginning. And as somebody who was a Nintendo kid and who then actually moved on to Sega, I was actually so excited that, like, when Capcom, when I found out Capcom announced, okay, we're going to make games for the Genesis now. I was like, great. The first one, of course, <laughs> being Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition. Sure. Which I got Christmas 93. And I did, and this is the same copy I've had since Christmas 93. But there was always, and I saw all the stuff that they would put out for Genesis. And there was always something missing. Like, there was always just something missing. Like, this is all great. Where's Mega Man? 
that was kind of my question. I was like, where is Mega Man? Why have we not gotten a Mega Man game on the Genesis? And I thought, well, maybe there must have been some exclusive agreement or something like that. But no. But uh, eventually, and we were talking about like before we like earlier on, we were talking about like, you know, your biggest pieces in your gaming collection. Can I talk about this like super, super quick? Yeah, of course. Um, So Mega Man is uh, did actually find up making his way onto the Genesis. And my first exposure to it, like when I found out that this was a thing, like I needed it in my life badly, but we never officially got it in, in the US. And that was Mega Man The Wily Wars. Ooh, it was available yes. on Sega Channel and we had Sega Channel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like we had it. We had it growing up on the Sega Channel. So I got exposed to it. But for my longest time, like I wanted a physical copy in my collection. But it was only released in Japan, in PAL areas, I believe. It was also in Brazil. I'd have to double check that. See, and that's what the box art was supposed to look like. And that's what it looked like, that one right there. That's, and that's really what it, cool shot. That's what you saw on Sega Channel back in the day. And it had like, they had the, the, all the ratings and whatnot. And I was just like, man, I wanted that so bad as a kid. But fast forward and to me and like, am I, uh, well, this was post-college. Like fast forward to post-college and being involved with like Facebook groups and whatnot. I was finally able to get a Mega Drive copy of Mega Man The Wily Wars. Ooh. And this is one of my most cherished pieces in my entire collection. It's complete in box. This is a PAL version. So I did actually finally get the PAL version complete in box. But if you look really closely at it, let me get it in the center of the shot here. Oh, nice. Uh, it, it's signed by KG and Fune. Whoa. Yeah, because I got a chance to. Well, I didn't get a chance to meet him personally because I was too far back in the line. But uh, there was a convention here, Screw Tech Gaming Convention in Texas, that he was a guest at and he was signing autographs. And I was literally a few people away from the end of the line, but a good buddy of mine who was further up in the line was able to get uh, his autograph. So, dude, that uh, is so cool. So, yeah, original copy, but thanks to the awesome people at Retrobit, they recently re released. I see Six Nations talk about it in the chat. They, re- they recently re released mm-hmm. Mega Man The Wily Wars. And even check your local retail, local uh, retro stores. They might still have these. And if they still have them, I highly, highly recommend it. Because not only does it come with like a whole bunch of bonus extras and the cart's cool, the manual's cool, but uh, they also tweak the gameplay a little bit too. Like they clean up the gameplay, they clean up some of the slowdown. And yeah, it's really cool. And then not only that, there are exclusive bonus levels in the Wally Wars as well. Is the Wally Wars like, are we talking real pricey to find that? If you try to get an original copy of this one, oh yeah, this one, whoops. uh, This one is super pricey. It oh, is man. super pricey to try to get now. I'm not sure about the retro bit release. I'm pretty sure they probably have because they're they're tougher to find now because they are now out of print. But check your local stores. Like they might still have these. And if you do get them, if you do see it, get it. Because for those who don't know what Mega Man the Wild Wars is, it's a compilation. It's a it's a compilation of Mega Man's one, two, and three on the Mega Drive, all completely remastered, redone, remastered graphics, remastered audio, and the Genesis versions of the Mega Man music all sound well, wonderful. And uh, Mikey says, I, mean, I think a, they did a great job. It's available on the Genesis Mini. That is correct. Awesome. It is also available on the Genesis Mini. So, but the Genesis Minis are also out of production. So that's yeah, true. If you, if you can find one, I also highly recommend that too. But yes, it is available on the Genesis and Mega Drive Minis as well. So well, that is a I, great collection share. And that's, uh, I love seeing unique rare games, especially Mega Man games. Um, and Retro is that Game your collection Bruce, right there? This is my complete. Mega Man NES collection that I completed nice. completed just a month ago, and it was I I had one, two, three, and six, and then I finally got the rest. And five was the toughest, and five is honestly one of the more expensive versions that they have. It is, um, and it just feels like really good to have a complete collection of something, and especially Mega Man. So this is like one of my good achievements from this year for collecting. I would say um, they're getting pricey, man. They are not. They are, they are not oh, getting yeah. cheap. Um, so if you don't get a Mega Man, if you don't have any now, in the next five to ten years, they're going to be really hard to to, to find and, and buy. I, I would imagine. Totally. But uh, but um, moving up that chain, uh, you know, I think there's a few other NES games that you wanted to mention, and Little Nimoy is one that you really like, right? Is that correct? Yes. I, so unfortunately, I didn't grab it. I didn't think to grab Little Nemo. I have a Little Nemo complete in box, but I didn't think to grab it. But yeah, Little Nemo is one of my personal favorites too. Just because, again, going back to side-scrolling platformers and just so the good. way that it's done, it's beautiful. It's such a cool like, game. The, the, the level design is just fantastic. It's that it's that perfect level of difficulty too. It's not too hard. It's not too easy. It's just challenging enough. 
and and also just getting towards that final battle that final boss battle goodness man it's yeah capcom just nailed it with this game yeah this was a beautiful game and i have fond memories playing it as a kid and uh six says i miss my mega man collection one of my biggest sale regrets oh yeah i understand i used to have all six of the games on nes as well my first uh mega man one was complete in box and yeah i don't have any of those anymore which is unfortunate. I wish I at least kept my first Mega Man. Now, how but. about them Disney and Capcom games on the NES, huh? How about those? This, this is where... <laughs> now this is where my love for Capcom really, really blows up. Because, like, like, I love Mega Man. Don't get me wrong. But to me, Capcom, honestly, their finest hour is in their Disney collection. And we got DuckTales. We got... I have them all. Well, all, well almost all of them. I didn't grab... Oh, see, I'm missing a couple of things. But I'll say I didn't grab my Famicom releases, Ooh, but... Um, that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, but there's, there's Disney's Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, which, again, a lot of people don't really talk about this one. This one's actually really, really good, too. Wow, and gee, that's really Kingdom, cool collection, man. That is... Re- yeah. Oh, there. that's um the Disney one, right? Yep, Chippendale. My uh, personal favorite. Out of all the Disney Afternoon games, Chippendale's my favorite. Chippendale like, was great. Chip and I love so it good. so so much. There's Darkwing Duck. All these are complete, by the way. All complete in box. Nice job. Let's man. see, but there's Darkwing Duck. I've had this one. I've had Darkwing Duck for a long time, like complete. This one, uh, and then of course there's the original Ducktales. So the original Ducktales, another classic. One that one another one of my personal favorites that people do not mention a whole whole lot too. The Little Mermaid. On yes. NES. This game is wow wonderful, wonderful game, and people sleep on it. They do it's like, not. It's so good. Um, we have uh, Mikey says, love the game. So, so underrated and was so happy to add this to the NES because it's a game no one talks about. I think he's talking about Little Nemo. Little Nemo? Yeah. Agreed. Red- wow. A lot of people are loving these Disney games. You could tell there's a lot of love to them. We got Chippendale mm-hmm. Todd. We got Darkwing Duck. I have Darkwing Duck on the Turbo Graphics completely. Oh, box. I have that too. But you know what? It wasn't <laughs> very good. It wasn't no. very good on the Turbo Graphics for some reason. Um, did you play Did you play Tailspin? I did Turbo play. Graphics? I, I did not play on Turbo Graphics. No, I did not. Um, oh, it's it's not good either. It's but not you know good. what else? You know what is good though? The NES one. <laughs> the NES, NES one is great, and yeah, you know the, this NES one. So good. You know, Adventures, uh, Disney Adventures was a game that I actually enjoyed too, and I have this one too. Um, but yeah, man, there you cannot. You could talk for hours. I mean, we could have done a whole show about the Disney Capcom games from the NES. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. And then Mickey Mouse Capade. That like that's Mickey that's Mouse the last Capade. one. Out of all the Disney ones, I know Mickey Mouse Capade is hard. This game is rough, like as far as difficulty wise, but it's really, really good. And of course, uh, there's always DuckTales 2 and Chippendales 2, but trying to get a US copy of both of those, <laughs> good luck. They yeah. are very, very hard to find. I have a Japanese Chippendales 2, but I don't have DuckTales 2, but I do have a Japanese one. But yeah, Capcom, and that's the thing, even going into the 16 bit days, like Capcom and Disney were just, they were like peanut butter and jelly. Like <laughs> that's I, a good I think way to put it. <laughs> every single game that they did was just outstanding. Even now, as an adult, was something that I always had that grand debate of like, oh, what was better? What was better, Aladdin on Genesis or Aladdin on Super NES? I, as a Sega fan, I have to, I have to admit, I like the Super NES Aladdin more. I do actually. I like it more. I think it's just it's a lot more well made. I love the platforming. I love the style on it. The Genesis one's fantastic too. But man, the the Capcom just nailed that. Yeah. Nah, dude, that that that's so true. But um, let's let's skim through a few other because there's so this is what's so great about Capcom is a lot of the good stuff they did in like, uh, especially in the '90s. There's like so much stuff. Uh, Final Fight. How could we yes. forget about Final Fight? Final Fight is one of my favorite beat 'em up arcade games ever made. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, it's one of my favorites. I know there's Streets of Rage on the Genesis and whatnot, but Final Fight is really great um oh it is absolutely it's great but it is also one of those things that like when you when you're talking about like the console wars like in the kids back in the days and i was just like that was one thing that us sega fans like we kind of held a little bit over we were just like yeah but we got the better version of final fight <laughs> that's funny yeah it's final fight cd which is so good but yeah final fight Another series I think is fantastic. The only way wrong, I love Streets of Rage, but Final Fight definitely deserves the love too. Yeah, and then of course we really hit our stride in the '90s, especially in the arcade with Street Fighter II. And I mean, we could talk hours about Street Fighter II, but this is a very important moment in the history of the arcade, especially for me as an early '90s arcade. My mom would drop me off at the arcade. 
I'd go right to the Street Fighter 2 machine, put my quarter on. I don't know if you were part of the coin line. You put your quarter on the machine. That's yep. what you did. Um, and Street Fighter 2, we can go hours into this game, but we have to mention it without a, ha a doubt. Just led the, the whole arcade circuit with its amazing games and releases um, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, we got Sandy says, fantastic memories playing Final Fight with my brother. Uh, Retro Game Bruce says, I wanted to be Hagar growing up. Hagar is the mayor of a city, by the way, just so you all yep. know. Um, George, One of the greatest mayors of all time. <laughs> yes, he's the best mayor. I would vote for him every time. Um, he'd also beat the, the crap out of anyone that messes with him. Um, yep. Jor says, uh, oh, wait, that's, uh, oh, we got some spam here. All right. You know you've made it when you got a spam in chat. All right. Yep, that's true. Uh, Genzo, <laughs> could you get rid of that guy? Um, I, I, I guess I could do it. Right, I never, I never get to ban people. All right, cool. There you go. <laughs> there we go. I banned them. Yes. The first time for everything. Insanity. Yeah, you were absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, me and my buddy uh, Wing and Box, we actually just did a stream together not too long ago, where we uh, we did the tag team championship run in Super NES version of Saturday Night Slam Masters, and of course I was Hager. I had to be Hager because like, yep, Here Mayor Slam Town. No, not actually the Mayor Slam Town. That's a different wrestler, but still. <laughs> That's a great game too. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. I enjoyed so, it. Shame the sequel never came home, but otherwise it's good. <gasps> How about Dark Stalkers? Mm -hmm. You gonna talk about Dark Stalkers now? Oh, mm, I love yeah. Dark Stalkers, man. Me too. This is such a good arcade fighter. This is like the cool when it came out in the arcade, man. I remember when it was new. It was really like talked about. It was like, whoa, look at the 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 very like cartoony style and just like awesome design of characters. Mm -hmm. Outstanding game. Outstanding uh game. That's something else to think about, too, and I'm glad that Darkstalkers is getting a little bit of a rebirth because there's that new Capcom fighting collection that's coming out later this year. It's got multiple versions of Darkstalkers. It's got a Super Gem Fighter. It's got Pocket Fighter with online play and everything. And I'm just like, that's so awesome that Capcom is bringing back Darkstalkers. Now, it's not a sequel, but at least it's still giving a little bit of love and another way for people to access this game. Yeah, the whole Darkstalkers line, Darkstalkers, Vampire Hunter, Vampire Savior, the whole line is just wonderful. It, I love it. it. And of course, Morgan, one of my all time favorite video game characters. Yes. It's like, yes, I, I love this game. So moving right along, um, in 1994, we can't forget the release of Street Fighter, the movie. Um, oh, with Jean-Claude Van Damme, the wonderful, late, great Raul Julia as M. Bison and did a, a hell of a job. Um, R.I.P., uh, my friend, because uh, as bad as this movie was good, it was everything in between. As a kid in the 90s seeing it, it was really cool. I wanted to mention this game because I also have the Saturn game, Street Fighter, the movie, the game. Me too. Me and too. and that, too. Yeah, that's a good game. I don't know. It's kind of fun and uh, and, and silly, but... This this movie, honestly, I liked it. I liked the Mortal Kombat original '90s movie, but for some reason, I had a little bit more of a close attachment to this movie. Me too. Um, it's so good in so many ways, um, and have so you, have bad. You seen have you seen any of the behind the scenes footage? Like I have interviews and whatnot. You have. Yeah, okay, yeah. so you could tell. You could tell. Like they knew that this movie was gonna be what it was, but they just had a blast doing it. Oh so man, it was you, fun. You know they and did. actually, Raul Julia's uh, adaptation of M. Bison was in impressive in my opinion mm -hmm. i mean john claude van damme was john claude van damme but um i just thought it was fun i mean you got balrog you got everybody there you know it's it was great um of course moving up the chain resident evil can't talk about capcom without mentioning resident evil um and uh this was the playstation i think the playstation one was the first one released if Correct. if i'm wrong Correct. um uh, Saturn says, I bought that for the Saturn 2, but traded it away. Well, you shouldn't have traded it away, my friend. No. <laughs> uh, and then after Resident Evil, we have Dino Crisis. And I know that you have a connection with Dino Crisis, right? I do. Because the thing is that with another thing that I loved growing up with dinosaurs, and as somebody who loved Resident Evil, but one of the things I didn't particularly like about Resident Evil nearly as much was the fact that there were times I just wanted to just, you know, rampage and have a lot more action in it. There's a lot more puzzle solving. There's a lot more management as far as like, you know, your guns and whatnot. Dino Crisis seemed to be more of the action equivalent to Resident Evil. Now, as they go more and more into the series, they started leaning more and more towards action to a point to where it kind of, you know, the series kind of lost its way. But the first Dino Crisis still holds so close to my heart, not only because like the amount of scare factors just hit me so much harder in this game than in Resident Evil. And the fact that everything was fully polygonal, it was a beautiful game. It played great, uh, loved Regina as a character. 
And even in the second one, because they decided to go in the second one with a different take on it, but that was great too. The third one, uh, it is what it is, but at least like, I would love to see, that's another one. It's like, Hey, Dark Stalkers has come back in some capacity. I would love to see them come back to Diner Crisis, like whether it be a remaster or remake or something, I would love to see them come back to Diner Crisis. Just keep them out of space. Yeah. Uh, uh, Youngling <laughs> said, they, <laughs> Earth. <laughs> Younglings actually said they, they definitely teased us this year to test for a Dino Crisis remake with that state of play. So mm -hmm. I think they did mention it. Santa says, Andy, do you have Resident Evil 4 VR? It's glorious. No, I don't, but Ooh. I could try it. Um, uh, but let's move up the chain as we're getting close. Strider 2, which is one you mentioned to me that uh, yes. you want to definitely bring up. Yes. Yeah, so again, I have Strider 2. I didn't grab it. I didn't think to grab it. But yes, yeah, Strider 2. This is another one I played in the arcade because I played the heck out of the original Strider in the arcade. And it's also another one of those big things that was just like once it came out on the Genesis, um, we didn't get it when we got it in 91, but I got it later on because honestly, as a kid, I didn't know that it came out on Genesis until way later. It's just how great of a port that original was. This is game really was. good. Yeah. And I loved it. But then the sequel, though, oh, the yeah. sequel just takes it to a whole nother level. Look at just this. It's so cool, gorgeous. man. Such and it a plays cool like game. butter. It plays like it's butter. So it's so good. There's this one thing I love about Strider, whether it be the first one or the second one, is just, you know how when you play a game that you just you just get the controls instantly, and then you just feel like a badass jumping around and like you're just swiping away at pretty much anything, even though you're really only pressing two buttons, right? You're just pressing jump and slash. But just the way that it's done is just so massively well done. I love this game. And I'll, I'll give you a heads up. I'm actually working on a YouTube video about Strider 2. And it's uh, I because I finally I I never owned it physically until recently, until a couple of weeks ago. Now I finally oh, nice. have one. That's and awesome. it's 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 a wonderful game. This so. I mean it, it's it's definitely up there. Mega Man 8. Let let's quickly go through these. Mega Man yes. 8, definitely yeah. one you wanted to talk about as well. Yep, now Mega Man 8, that's always been one of my personal favorites, too. And I don't have the Saturn version, unfortunately. Do you have it on Saturn? Oh, no. You know, it's one that's yeah. a big hole in my collection, and man, is it expensive. It uh, is, like, dummy expensive now, unfortunately. I, you know, I did have it, though. There was a time I had, like, a lot more of my Saturn games, but I uh, some of them got lost in my original collection, and that was in my original collection. So mm, um, it's yeah. going to be hard to get that one for me. But, hey, Absolutely. I'm still on a— always get it for PS1? I, I mean, know, it's but a lot cheaper there. one day my my goal is to have a complete American run Saturn collection. Um, I, I have over eighty of them now. Um, you got a so long way to go. <laughs> I got a long way to go, but uh, it, I gave up on that one. I was trying to go for a complete U.S. Saturn collection, but I I had to unfortunately draw the line on it because it's like, yeah, once Mega Man started topping like in the in the mid to highest triple digits for Mega Man Eight, I was like, yeah, I can't. Eh. But but for anybody who is going for that, go for it. You know, and I'm gonna find it. Big one day. wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna you get will. It one day. One day I'm gonna get lucky. Um, you will. Now moving up to like a little bit more, getting into the modern era of games. We got Devil uh, Devil May Cry, which was uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what's your connection to the series? So Devil May Cry, like the first one, I I remember playing a lot lot more vividly. It wasn't really until Devil May Cry three that was the one that that really like struck in with me just between like Dante and Virgil and their story and to me I think it's it's a lot a lot of fun I didn't particularly dive into Devil May Cry nearly as much as I did with Resident Evil but uh but I actually really really enjoy it too it's weird I like Devil May Cry is a series that like Capcom like they kind of they're always like really on the fence of whether or not they want to come back to it like they'll pop in like a collection or something like that it'll drop it on switch and say hey well Devil May Cry is still around but uh it's something that I'm not really sure if they're really interested in trying to go back to the well on a little bit too much, especially after that that uh, that weird reboot that came out on um, on like on 360 and PS3. That was strange, but uh, like I said, it's, it's one that I like, but I don't necessarily love Devil May Cry, but I still enjoy it though. How about Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney? <laughs> so Phoenix Wright. Now I, I, uh, <laughs> the thing is, that the Phoenix Wright. The games themselves, like, I love the concept. It's one of those things that I actually really, like, enjoy more watching than playing. Now, my wife, Ronchon, a.k.a. Ronchon does things. She is a huge Phoenix Wright fan. Like, she she's loved it ever since the very beginning on the DS. And to me, it's like, I love the characters. I love the story. Like, I love the style. And so, like, I love to get into it in that aspect. As far as me actually playing it, it's cool. But I, I probably get, like, distracted a little bit more and I want to play something a little bit different. But... Oh, yeah, actually, Youngle's in the chat 
Yeah, I think I think that's probably what it was for me too. That Bayonetta kind was of Bayonetta the, wasn't the a Bayonetta wasn't Capcom though. I'm pretty no sure. Bayonetta was Sega. Sega was yeah. Sega. Nintendo was. now, but was Sega. And uh, like yeah, it's still technically a Sega. And then let's move to 2002, and we got the first Resident Evil movie. Any connection to the Resident Evil movies? I wanted mm-hmm. to mention this. Not yeah. me, me personally, not really. But not a huge connection to them. Like I've seen the first three. I haven't seen any of the other ones past that. And to me, it's like they're fine films, but as far as like Resident Evil goes, like and and how how close did they get to the actual lore and the style of whatnot of Resident Evil? No lie, you kind of missed the mark. But as far as films go, they're still entertaining. They're still not bad. At least the first three, anyway. I can't comment on the rest. Of I didn't know but... Michelle Rodriguez was in the first Resident Evil. Okay. Yep, she's in the first one. Oh my god, that's cool. I that's how much I don't. I never really watched them. So, um, so I just want to mention that. But let's we can't talk about Capcom without mentioning. Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter yes. is a prominent IP in the Capcom lore. Any connection to Monster Hunter? It's so interesting because I played Monster Hunter back in the day on the PS2. Now, granted, that was around the same time that I was also playing Fantasy Star Universe and Fantasy Star Online. So my attention was more geared to that. But um, Monster Hunter, for some reason, I completely missed Monster Hunter, like from the PS2 all the way up until like kind of recently, right? Like I had missed a whole chunk of it. So as far as it is, I'm kind of a noob when it comes to the franchise, but I'm a noob that actually is really, really I'm a noob too. To learn. Totally. I'm starting Monster Hunter Rise next month. I'm very excited. So, and that's one of the things I thank you, Capcom. Like, I'm very excited to to delve into the series because it's after watching people stream it, watching people play it, all the things you could do, all the customizations you could do, all the different type of monsters you could slay. It's a gorgeous game. Uh, and I can completely understand why it's become such a huge franchise for for Capcom, and I can't wait to get into Rise. Yeah. So what's cool? My connection to Monster Hunter, the only one I really played was the one on the Wii U, Monster Hunter Ultimate. Um, oh, nice. I I actually really enjoyed it. And on the gamepad, then it was like really cool, and you could play with people, and people could talk to you through the Wii U gamepad. It was actually mm. pretty cool. I loved it, and I played it a ton on the Wii U, actually. Uh, believe nice. it or not, but that's my only connect. I'm not a big Monster Hunter guy. I do appreciate the the series, and I think they're really cool games. Um, All Dead- love for the Wii U. Now, one <laughs> series I love personally is Dead Rising, and I I I want to mention. Capcom made Dead Rising, and I actually love this game. Yeah, I completely miss Dead Rising. Uh, I don't, I I don't know what it is. I, it's, I love it's one it. of those games. Like I know I would love this game, but for just for some reason or another, I just completely missed it. Now I would love to go back and play it sometime. Dead Rising but, Two was God, great. I mean, I played all of them, and now they're not making them anymore, technically. But that not, but I bet you they're going to make another one eventually. It's not the never. they're not the greatest games in the world. But as a Walking Dead fan, I, so just to give you context, I'm a I used to collect the Walking Dead comics before nice. even the show came out. So I've nice. always been a zombie guy. So zombie games are fun to me. Like a uh, shout out to Zombie We uh, Zombie U on the Wii U, which is a really <laughs> underrated game, honestly. Um, but Dead Rising, man. I don't know. I really liked it, and I, I miss these games. Uh, so had to mention because Capcom does uh, does own the IP for uh, Dead Rising, uh, and then we got uh, Lost Planet. Any connection to Lost Planet? This okay. is a game. Hey, yeah, Lost Planet. Yes, I loved the original Lost Planet on 360. That was one of the first games because, like, when I got my 360, that was one of the first games that I really jumped into and played. And it's one of those things I was just like, you would have never really guessed that this was a Capcom game, like actually really jumping into it. Right. But it's just the action on it is so well done. I love like the flight mechanics and everything with this game. And uh, it's just such a shame that this is a, this is kind of a franchise that kind of fell from grace. Like the first one was really, really good. And I loved it. I played the original. I played the Colonies edition. Like I played both of them. It was so good. Then I played Lost Planet 2. And like Lost Planet 2 is it's not the same like it's not quite the same and then i haven't touched three i've been kind of scared to play lost planet three because i heard like lost planet three really kind of lost its way but it's a franchise that was just like if you love like third person style action shooters especially with the like the different tiles types of environment it's a unique kind of shooter and it's it's definitely worth checking out yeah and you know i i Wanted to pull one more last thing. And by the way, it's been really great going down. Um, I got to do more of these focus like uh, publisher episodes where we really dive into like episodes. So, dude, this has been really cool. Um, yeah. We're closing out on the hour, but I did want to go through what 
rated on Met, using Metacritic as a reference, like what are the top 10 considered rated uh, Capcom games of all time? Marvel vs. Capcom is at number 10. Uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is at number 10. Um, Resident Evil is at number 9. Ooh. Super Street Fighter 4, if I'm reading my Roman numerals right, mm-hmm. is uh, number 8. <laughs> You can put, you can put well, okay, okay. Wait, okay, number Daring. seven. I was like, Daring. Resident Evil 2. Okay. Number six, Beautiful oh, Joe. Oh, man, Beautiful Joe. <sighs> another one. That's that's another one that, like, Capcom, why you let that one go? That was so good. It was Akami. very good. Akami, yep. very Wonderful. good game. Wonderful game. Number Especially f- on the Wii. Yes. Uh, number four, Street Fighter Alpha 3. My um, favorite. Really good. I have Street Fighter Alpha for the Saturn. That's my fa- that's my favorite Street Fighter game. Is Alpha Three. I I love this game. Street Fighter Four. I'm doing my Roman numerals correct here. Am I am I am I crazy? Yep. That's okay. Because right. <laughs> I'm the worst <laughs> at Roman numerals. Uh, Devil May Cry is number two, 2001. Oh, I'm surprised wow. that that's so high up there. Me but, too. And then Resident Evil Four is number one on Metacritic as the highest rated uh, game. Now, what I did before we went on the show is I did tweet. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. A lot of people commented. What's your favorite Capcom game of all time? And we got people that shared like this person said Cyberbots, Power Stone 2, Alien vs. Oh. Predator, Demon Crest. And, and look, there's a million other Demon games Crest. we didn't oh. get to talk about. Uh, I know, right? Power uh, Stone. Alien vs. Predator seems like yeah. a popular one. We got this person listed Mega Man 2, Street Fighter 2, Resident Evil 2, 4, Devil May's Cry. Wow, a lot of people love Capcom with all these comments here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. Uh, Street Fighter 2010. Woo. Um, underrated. Underrated. A lot of people hate on that game. And it's very, very good. It's just very hard. Uh, like, young, you're down for the challenge. It's so good. Younglings, I have Super Puzzle Fighter on the Saturn. Nice. Me too. Great game. Uh, well. Aladdin for Super Nintendo. Um, they did Aladdin? Oh, I guess they did. Yep. yep. They did. Uh, Dead Rising 2, we got Mega Man 3, we got Street Fighter 2, a lot of fans here. They're loving it. Lost Planet, which we talked about. Darkstalkers mentioned. We see uh, Phoenix Phoenix Wright. Wright. (laughs) Uh, Devil May Cry. Oh, Cadillac. Knights of the Round. Knights of the Round. And then Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Wow. One we didn't mention. 1942 here, we got that mentioned. Uh, Of course, a lot of Mega Man. God God Hand. God Hand on PS2. Great game. Great Um, game. Very hard to find now, but... Very good game. Power Stone obviously was really great. Uh, mm-hmm. Breath of Fire three, mention here twice, uh, and yeah, there's a lot, a lot of uh, fans here. This guy says trick and snowboarding Mega Man game. Oh wow, wow, callback. Did, did you know, in trick and snowboarding, you can play as Jill Valentine in that game. <laughs> uh, it's it's great. Like, dude, this is great. This really shows you, like, not only has Capcom become such a stable name in the video game industry, they really do make great games. And, um, they do. And I'm really, really happy about that, you know? Um, well, anyway, my friend, uh, did you have fun today? I know we, you know, I'm sure we could go another three hours if we wanted to, right? Oh, yeah. Right, G? <laughs> uh, I just want to say that this has been, like, really cool. Um, not only, like, kind of learning about the history together, um, but talking about some of our favorite Capcom games. Um, just wanted to say, G, you know, like, uh, I like to ask a question, uh, you know, before we leave is, you know, what do you think about the industry in general? Um, where do you see especially retro game collecting in the next few years? Do you think it's going to become harder and harder to find stuff? I um, just wanted your view on the future of retro collecting before we kind of head out here. Well, I know one of the, the strange things about retro collecting is that it almost seems to many times go in the phases, right? Like there'll be phases of what's popular and what's hot, like what's going to be like, what's going to be worth more and what's not going to be worth more a little bit later. And then like the prices may or may not fluctuate. Like there'll be times like NES is hot for a bit and it'll go down. Genesis will really be hot for a bit and it'll go down. I think that like the difference between now and then is because so many more people are into collecting, less people are selling. Like more people are, and so you no know, less people are selling means less copies are in circulation, which means prices start going up because the demand's not going to get any weaker. And it's like I think as more as we, especially when like different generations start growing up too, and they start really getting curious about the games that got them started. It's like say people who are into who, whose first Mega Man game was Mega Man Nine or Mega Man Eleven. They want to go back and experience some of the older ones. It's just that I think that 
And right now, considering that pricing for retro games as a whole is kind of high, I hate to say it, but I feel like it's just going to get higher. It's like, yeah, I feel like I... it's just going to get higher. And my thing is just that if you're if you're a collector, like say to myself, like I, I used to be a much larger collector than I am now. I think I'm now finally in a, a position where I don't I'm not really actively looking for as much stuff except for like maybe small things like I want to finish my Klonoa collection and a couple of other things. But I saw anybody don't get discouraged, continue to go for what you're really going for. But just understand that, like, there is a high possibility that the longer that you more kind of simmer and wait on certain things, I think pretty much everything now is going to start just like either steadily rising or you might get those moments where like they'll you'll get a spike and nothing will really like you don't even know. Yeah, but. That's why I say anything. Yeah, I think it's just gonna go up as as time goes. Heck, even again, saying any crypto, somebody in the chat. Like, I like my stuff to be complete in box. Like, when I'm looking for NES or Super NES stuff, like I like it to be complete in box. And yeah, it's going to be the toughest acquisitions, especially for Nintendo, because yeah, a lot of their boxes were paper boxes. People threw them away. Yeah. So, or it might not be in like the best condition, or however. And then with Sega, because most of their boxes are clamshells. Like most of them are clamshells. Most of us, like we like to have them on the shelf. They don't part with us. That's why you, you don't really see Sega stuff in the wild a whole, whole lot. Yeah, but, yeah. My my thing with it is like everyone keeps saying there's a bubble and that's going to crash. It's actually not going to crash because here's no. here's my thing. As we head into this digital revolution where things are less tangible than they ever were, meaning like games will not be – eventually we're going to get to a generation where they're not going to release physical versions. And the more we get into yeah. that realm, the more these things are going to stay valued and they're not going to change. So if you're collecting, it's tough to come in right now and start collecting with the way prices are. Um, but there are still things out there that you could look at. You know, NES is still sort of affordable. There's still a lot of NES that's affordable. But man, don't even try to go with Sega Saturn because you'll you won't <laughs> be able to buy anything. Um, even, dude, gee, even sport games on the Saturn are starting to yes. go up, which is yes. like what used to be able to get like Saturn sport games for like ten dollars. They're going up to twenty, forty, fifty dollars now. But um, oh yeah. But yeah, uh, before we go, one other shot. Anything we should know about uh, just your content in general? Anything coming up for you or um, anything like that? Yes. So as far as my YouTube channel goes, uh, new content starting next month. So I've got a really big video all about the Sega Genesis 32X, a brand new series I'm starting up. Uh, that's actually starting up next month. More Sonic the Hedgehog content. Uh, I've got a couple of treasure chests down the line. Like Basically, yeah, the YouTube, even though I haven't been on it for a bit, but um, I'm actually coming back real strong. I've got uh, conventions coming up that I'm going to be at. I'm going to be at Retropalooza Houston uh, very, very soon. At the end of this month, I'm going to be at the Southeast Game Exchange in South Carolina, uh, Game on Expo in Phoenix, and Classic Game Fest in Austin. Yeah, I'm going to be at a lot of different conventions coming soon. So definitely, like, look out for me there. And then, of course, I'm here on Twitch. Uh, it's like, I'm basically here on Twitch. I stream Sundays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And uh, yeah, all kinds of like awesome stuff. Every Sunday, Shining Force. Every Tuesday, Sega stuff. Thursday's Breath of the Wild. Fridays normally switch stuff for viewers. And yeah, that's that's generally the best way to get a hold of me. Sounds like you got a, a full Rolodex of things to come, and that's really exciting, man. And honestly, yeah. like you know, knowing that you and I have we go way back in early days of Twitter. It's really good to kind of come full circle, actually have a really great conversation about retro games coming on the podcast this morning. Uh, thanks everyone in chat. Really appreciate uh, the love and support. And I just want to say hello to everyone on VOD that's watching as well. We appreciate you as well. Uh, <laughs> before we go, I always like to say one thing. Um, we only get one shot at this. So remember to be nice to people because that's important. Uh, again, G, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, we will be back next Saturday with another episode of Cafe BTW, a morning gaming podcast. Uh, you can find out all my stuff below. There's links everywhere, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, whatever. And just a reminder, if you missed the live, we're right here on YouTube. Uh, all the VODs are available same day um, as the podcast, and uh, we'll be sharing it all week. But uh, again, G, I hope you have a good weekend, man, and I uh, really appreciate it. You too. Thank you. You got Thank it, you. man. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. Yeah, it was awesome. All right, everyone. Until next time, we'll see you. See you next week. I'm Andy, and that's G, and we'll <laughs> talk to you next time. Take care. All right. See you later.